Hi, I'm Jesse Dillon, and this is my co-host... Priscilla Cohen, and this is Jesse's Office. Today we're talking to legendary drummer Jim Keltner. He may be the only artist ever to work closely with both John Lennon and Mr. Dillon. He shares shares stories about recording some of the greatest songs of our time and how he stays cool under the pressure of performing with legends. But first, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch this, which is an incredible episode, and other incredible episodes, or subscribe to Jesse's Office wherever you stream your podcasts. Feel free to leave comments, and we try to respond whenever we can. So, thanks for coming in. You know, talk to me. You know, on on uh, on this thing. You know, it's like you. So, you know, here's my first question for you: What makes a good drummer? What makes a good drummer? Yeah. <laughs> what makes a good drummer? Well, it's not just keeping time, is it? No. No, no. Well, there are people who would argue that. I mean, you know, like, you talking about being a studio drummer? Well. Then, then yeah, you should be able to keep real good time. That's probably the most important thing. Right. Uh, the but, other, like, but what makes, like, Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich? Oh, Buddy Rich, man, Buddy... Buddy, I used to love uh, reading his quotes. Buddy Rich, Miles Davis, Bob, uh, Dylan, right. uh, John, you know, the, the people in your life who would just say these things that would live forever, you know? Sure. And uh, Buddy, one of the things that Buddy said that I loved the most was uh, he said, uh, I forget what the, exactly what the context was, but it was that he was talking about how he plays differently according to how he leaves the house, whether he had a fight <laughs> with his wife or not, right. you know, and how bad the fight was and what the fight was about. Right. Excellent. You know, and so I just completely, who wouldn't identify with that yeah. who's married? You know? Right. So, uh, yeah, Buddy, Buddy uh, was known, you know, unfortunately Buddy was known just as the chopmeister, you know, the guy right. with the chops, the greatest chops. But there was way more to it than that. He... Uh, what was great about him was that he straddled the worlds. You know, he <clears throat> he came from vaudeville, right, and and actually went into bebop. He saw the birth of bebop, right. So that's like really, really a a, a big chasm there. You know, this this thing that could have uh, uh, could have made him just like be nobody, you right. Know, after that, but instead he blossomed with all that, and uh, but he didn't do it in a, what you would say, a real nice way, like, right. you know, that people would like to have seen him. You know, Buddy wasn't like that. Although maybe so, he couldn't have been like that. Maybe he couldn't have gotten anywhere if he wasn't sort of hard. Well, it, it, it's probably true. Uh, yeah. Because, you know, they that, didn't want him to be that kind of drummer, right? They that's want, exactly right. You know, they wanted him to play, you know, just in the back of the band. You know, they didn't, they didn't want him to do the Gene Krupa, you know, sort of thing and take it to that next level. You yeah. Know? Yeah, that's true, but but there was no holding him back. You yeah, know? I mean, he was he was amazing, and he's still to this day. The thing about Buddy Rich is, I have you know all these uh, drummers are my friends. You know, that's my world. Sure. So these guys, Dave Weckl and um, Vinny Kaliuta, you know, and uh, 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 Lang, all these guys that are like from another planet with their technique and stuff. You know, right. when you hear them play. It's a thrill. For me as a drummer, it's a thrill. Right. To see, it's like watching Cirque du Soleil, you know. It's, right. it's not human, you know, what yeah. they're doing. Uh, but uh, with, but we, if you compare, which you don't want to do, but with Buddy, yeah. Buddy had those kind of chops with a, with a, with a, a, a taste of, of bebop and vaudeville that just made it be so much more. And I, I say this, I, I don't want to say this, uh, you know, dismissing the, uh, the greatness of my, of my friends who are, are way, you know, younger than, obviously, than Buddy. But Buddy had a thing that's just, in, and I don't want to say soulfulness because then that sounds like I'm saying the, other, sure. the, the new guys are not soulful, which is definitely not true. But 
the kind of soul that Buddy had was just, it was just, it's, it's know, still I, compelling after all these years. You know, did you, because um, you originally, like, you came from Tulsa, yeah? Yeah. And and in Tulsa, where, what did you, did you have a radio? Did you have a, like, how did, <laughs> and, and all those, all those guys who came with you, I don't know if you met them in Tulsa, but they all, you all stayed in a house in the valley, but your right, dad, together. your dad was drumming, wasn't it? Yeah, no, yeah. no, that, that was them. Yeah. They, they all came out later. I came out when, my dad brought me out, uh, brought us out. Yeah. Uh, when I was, I had just turned 13. Uh, in April, and we left in September. And you were a fan of jazz at this point, yeah? No, I wasn't a fan of anything, really. I was just a, I was a fan of baseball. I was a baseball right. player. <laughs> right. You know, in the great Oklahoma tradition. And I was good, too. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but when my dad brought home the drums... Uh, that kind of, you know, it really got my attention. Now, was and it then, a magical moment? These drums showed up and you were like, wow, this is what I'm going to do? No, he, he was kind of, you know, he had, there's a whole story I've told this many times about how I learned uh, at the Actar Shrine Drum Corps yeah. right. uh, there in Tulsa, which is a pretty odd thing when I think back on it now. Tulsa yeah. had, an, had a place like that. Uh, but I would go with him to rehearsals. And uh, one... One evening after the rehearsal, I picked up his sticks and I was playing what I had been hearing. And it really got their attention, you know, right. and especially my dad. So he brought home his drum for me to play. And then from there, uh, he decided that he would get me a set of drums. So he went to Dick Borden's uh, right. pawn shop down on uh, First and Main and uh, brought back a like a really funky... It, it was even funky then, you right. know. And this was, what, 19... 54, something right. like that, uh, an old set of Slingerlands, which you see the type of drums that uh, that uh, Buddy Rich would have been sitting sure. behind, you know, or Gene. And um, so I started playing them, and then uh, when we were, but I wasn't, you know, playing professionally or anything, but then when we left to uh, come to California, which was a huge move for, for a 30-year-old guy, you know. Yeah. Uh, the thing that was impressive later, not then, but he he bought a trailer, a little trailer, and he put our little funky TV. It was a brand, you know, it was yeah. it was like a brand new thing, the TV. So it was a big deal, and we put the TV in there and my drum set and our clothes, right, suitcases, and that was it, right. So you know he, but my dad was a bit of a drummer himself. You know, I mean he. He, uh, other than just the marching thing, you know, he. Now, I did, never heard him play with the trap set, but. Uh, now, when did you hear Chuck Berry? And did you know what it was when you heard it? Oh yeah, when when I heard Chuck Berry, the thing was for me was that I when I when we got to Pasadena and I was growing up, I became a jazz snob. I just right. I didn't like anything to do. I didn't have anything to do with the rock and roll thing that was going on, except the stuff that was like Maybelline, you know. Right, uh, Chuck, um, um, Elvis, you know, some okay. of the things that Elvis did. I mean, yeah. there were things that you just couldn't deny. Right. But then when the Beatles hit, yeah. uh, Cynthia was all over that. My wife was, was you know, and, and she, you know, and the, my, my uh, youngest son, uh, they would watch, you know, and just, and they'd talk about, hey, come, you got to see it. I go, nah, right. I'm not going to. So I just, I stayed away from it. I didn't. I didn't want to like it. Right. And wait, um, why? Years later. Well, because it was uh, it was popular, mm -hmm. and I was very like not into popular stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I was in if it wasn't Miles or Coltrane, mm -hmm. or, right? You know, Philly Joe, and which was probably all great training for what you did later. Even though it's well, it turns out obviously, yeah, that it was it was the greatest thing that could have happened to me. But you know, years later, John, when I met John, he cracked up because uh, you know he thought that I would have been a real rocker. Yeah, <laughs> and I, thought, I hated rock. And so roll. do you do you remember he, he when you that was, do you remember when you met John Lennon? Yeah, uh, uh, I I met John in like seventy uh, one. It's I'm I'm trying to since I knew I was going to talk about John and, and Bob, I tried to do a little homework and, and uh, 
I'm still a little confused. Uh, chronological stuff mm -hmm. is sure. not easy for me because it's just always jammed. Right. You know, and I had I have this book that uh, you know the only the only person that ever saw it was George actually. Right. And George always wanted to do a book with me based right. on that. Right. And I said, okay, let's do it. And then he goes and he takes off. You know? Right. So, but uh, um, I mean, did you meet John? Did you meet John first by himself? Did I'm, you? No, I met Yoko first. Right. Yeah. What was, uh, it, was this? Was this before Yoko was with John, or John was? They were already together. They were. Um, yeah, they were already together. They had yeah. already been making like you know headlines and stuff and right. doing stuff. And uh, is this and, double fantasy? No, no, that was the it's last earlier. thing they did. Right. That was like in 1980. Right. It was right before he died. But uh, no, this was um, the thing that I knew about Yoko was that she, what I liked about what I'd read about Yoko was that she was a jazz New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And she, she, she knew all the jazz, the jazz guys. She knew Ornette Coleman, which blew my mind. And I right. said, what? And, um, so, uh, and she was an avant-garde artist. Right. So that really appealed to me. And then when I, uh, with the earthquake, this is a long story, but the earthquake hit here and uh, it, it, it started right when I was landing and I was traveling with Klaus Foreman. Klaus and I had just done right. a, um, um, a project with uh, Jim Price, the trumpet player. Mm -hmm. that ended up playing with the Stones. And uh, he was doing a little solo project, and cl he had Klaus, and, uh, and Klaus and I bonded pretty good because, because my favorite bass player ha had always been Carl Radel, the guy from you know, Delaney and Bonnie. Right. And he was also from Tulsa. Right. And he had this, this feel, and plus he was kind of my teacher. Right. He's the one that kind of showed me about rock and R&B right. and you know, who to listen to. And, uh, and um, so... When he got busy doing his stuff, and I, did, I wasn't able to play with him for a while, and then I met Klaus, and Klaus was like a version of Carl right. without the virtuosity of Carl. Right. But he had that kind of feel that sounded, that made the drummer sound good. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about musicians, you know, guitar players, bass players, keyboard guys. You know, do you make the drums feel good? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you do, then pretty much you're going to sound great. You're going right. to feel good, you know, but that's kind of the job, really. Uh, you know, and obviously the singer and the song. Right. But anyway, so we were traveling together and we, we landed in uh, uh, at Heathrow. Um, the way we had it figured out later was that, uh, you know, Klaus went on his way and, and I went right to the uh, hotel called the White House because uh, Leon and Carl and everybody were there mm -hmm. on tour. And um, they brought me upstairs uh, and they said, you got to watch the newscasters. It's funny. They say things like hell and damn. And, <laughs> right. And uh, that's really... So we're sitting there watching, and then suddenly the, the news comes on about the uh, earthquake in Hollywood, centered in Hollywood. Right. And I'm flipping out, and I'm calling, and uh, I'm, I got a, like a... I finally got through to somebody. I, f I ended up calling the Red Cross because I couldn't think of anybody else to call. Right. And, uh, and they said, okay, what are the victims' names? And, and that... Right. Yeah, right. like, well, they're not victims. Yeah. I mean, I hope. And so anyway, uh, that whole thing was so traumatic. And I, when I got Cynthia on the phone, I said, just get the kids and get over here. Right. And uh, take all the money out of the bank, yeah, which right. was $3,000. Right. <laughs> and uh, that, was, that was a lot of money, though. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she got yeah. a, a flight and yeah. uh, everything. And um, so... Uh, then while we were there, we we uh, we we rented a little pad on a, a, a like a I forget what they call them, but they're above. You know, it was in King's Row. Sure. It was on King's Row in Chelsea, yeah. which was the happening place. But I didn't know right. about it then. I didn't know that it was the happening place, and, and really didn't care. It just was. It was right across the street from a butcher shop, and uh, they had the lamb's leg, the whole thing. <laughs> and yeah. Cynthia was really. She's always been a great cook, so she, uh, our first dinner there was like a lamb's, uh, what do right. you call it? A leg of lamb. Leg of lamb, yeah. leg, lamb's leg. What the yeah. hell? Anyway, uh, and it was incredible. And so it was a, a really great time. And then I got a call um, 
from somebody to go uh, play with Yoko. Right. On her record. And I didn't know, but it was going to be the Fly record. Right. And uh, so I, uh, they had Bobby Keys and I together. Right. And, uh, and we, we, um, we just had a ball, you know. She just wanted us to do the craziest stuff. She's and very misunderstood as an artist, yeah? I think Yoko, yeah, maybe as, uh, as, you know, in the beginning... But she had a lot of strikes against her, you know, because the people, the Beatle people who were fanatic, mm -hmm. fanatical, you know, they, they didn't want anybody uh, interfering with that whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So y you know how that went. Uh, well, y'all are not of, of my generation, so you don't really know. Well, but it was know, it yeah. was bad. I mean, know. they they didn't they didn't like her. You know, a lot of people yeah. did not like her. And but so then, I was always saying, oh, she's great. She's fantastic. She's really creative, and she's. Uh, and she's Japanese, you know. She's not. She's. She doesn't. Uh, she. She speaks with her accent. You mm -hmm. know. She. Yeah. She doesn't. Uh, she never like tried. I guess hard to, to sound like she was uh, from somewhere else. So and then, did you? Did she bring you to meet John at some point? Did was John around the session? Well, that's the other part that where the chronology gets weird for me because I think, that um, what confuses me is that when this latest thing came out with the. Uh, with uh, Imagine, all the stuff that, uh, that Yoko put out. Um, I'm looking at days and I'm going, oh, wow, I, I didn't realize. So now I'm a little confused, but it must have been that I met John that night. Right. Later. Because in my mind's eye, I can see him like heavy. He wasn't, you know, he was broad. Like he was, he was wearing overalls. Right. And his face was, he was like cheeky looking. Like it just wasn't the John Lennon right. that I remember seeing right. in, the, in the pictures and the magazines and things. And so I remember being kind of fascinated by that. And then she was a little on the chunky side. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, right. uh, which was, and she looked great. Right. I've always yeah. preferred chunky, you know. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, um, so I remember that, and then I, and then I think, uh, according to what these dates are saying, I think that that was the night that, um, that I heard... Now, see, I, I hear myself say this, and then I realize I can't say that because that's not true. It's <laughs> the first time I played with John was when I was staying with Eric. This was after this trip. Right. Um, so I may, I must have met John then because John was totally not like that anymore. I mean, right. he, he had slimmed down. Right. And then years later, I found out how they did that was uh, with their diet, their right. uh, macrobiotic mm -hmm. uh, diet. They yes. would just slim down real quick. So you, would, so you met him when you were playing with him and Eric Clapton? Yeah, so what happened was uh, then uh, a few months later, I was back with, with Eric, uh, staying at Eric's house in Surrey. And we were driving in every day to record at Olympic in Barnes mm -hmm. um, with Stevie Winwood. They were writing together. And mm -hmm. the idea was that it was going to be some kind of album, you know, um, of their writing. And, um, and I can say this uh, because, uh, you know, Eric, uh, Eric and I have talked about it. And I think it's kind of, you know, it's, Eric is not ashamed of those days but he's he's put them behind him mm -hmm. you know in a good way Are th but uh we, they were crazy days and so nothing really got done like as as it should have been it should have been an amazing project but we were so messed up you know um uh you've you know what got you accepted into that club so early you know these are these are the best musicians in the world working at that time and you're you're yeah. playing with them all. Like, what do you well, and what do you think it was? It just well, what happened with Eric was that he he uh, he became a big fan of Delaney and Bonnie, right? And that record that we did is the record that put us all on the map. That right. got that got Bobby Keys to become a Rolling Stone, right. for, for most of his life. Yeah, and um, and it because of that record, uh, you know, I was hanging with uh, Eric all the time because Eric was hanging with us. You know, we right. were, he was on the. In fact, when they did the Blind Faith tour which uh, Delaney and Bonnie opened up for, he would uh, uh, ride with us on our bus, our funky bus, uh, rather than having his own car and his own plane like right. uh, Ginger did, Ginger Baker and right. uh, Jack Bruce. They had their own thing, you know. 
and uh, Eric would uh, travel with us, and and Delaney basically showed him how to make his voice more powerful. Right. Um, we'd be on the bus, and uh, and you'd hear him screaming in the back. Uh, Delaney would be showing Eric how to call hogs, right. <laughs> which that's what Delaney did. You know, right. he, Delaney was a, a white kid from Mississippi. Right. You know, was it? Um, uh, what is it that? Put, what's that quality that John had? You know, it's it's it's. And also you know, the nobody... first moment of playing with John. Yeah. yeah well, I mean... the, the uh, to go back just real quick. Uh, while I was staying with Eric there, uh, there was a phone call in the morning. I was up before Eric. Uh, uh, one of the only people in the world probably that that slept later than me, and uh, I couldn't. I wasn't allowed to wake him up, and I, w- I wouldn't have done that anyway. Uh, but the phone rang and it just wouldn't stop ringing and I was in the kitchen eating and so I picked it up and it was Spectre. Right. And, uh, and you know, when he said it's Phil Spectre, I, I paid attention and he said, I told him I can't wake Eric up, you know. I, uh, he said, well, do you want to come and play on John's record? And I said, I said yeah. <laughs> and so... Uh, now, what so, was that like? You snooze, you lose, you know? What, what, <laughs> well, so, yeah. so, so what was that like when you showed? Did you bring your drums and no, you're like so come clanging is, in the door with your drums? and you're, No, you know, this, this guy the, from Mad Dogs and Englishmen, uh, right. there was oh, a band yeah. that used to open up for us. I know uh, that band. Yeah, you remember that? Yes, uh, great band. There was a band called Stone the Crows. Right. Okay. And uh, the drummer was Colin Allen. Right. A uh, really wonderful English guy. And uh, he... he uh, we became good friends on the on the Mad Dogs tour, and uh, so when I got to England and and I, I had his number obviously, and and when this thing happened, I called him all excited and I said, but I don't know what to do about drums, and he said, use you can use my drums. I got a little Gretsch, a little yellow Gretsch set, right? And I ended up using those drums on uh, with with John, with George, with all kinds of people. But for, so what what do you so, remember that session? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's something you don't forget. You know, yeah. it, it's so what, like the so first. So you walk in, and it's like, do you get there before John? Is is Phil Spector? Does he know what he's doing at that moment with this this opportunity? Is it like everybody knows it's going to be a special thing? Well, he it's it's Phil Spector and it's John Lennon. That's all I knew. Yeah, and I and but Klaus was playing too, so then I made me feel better because yeah, I knew that I could play good with Klaus. Right, and. Um, and Nicky Hopkins was playing, and I didn't know Nicky at that right. point. But I didn't realize it was like Nicky was one of the greatest piano players in the whole friggin' world. Right. He was like, his touch was like from some other place. So he when just you didn't came in, like how, long did it, how long did it take to figure that out for you that you were in, with good company here? It, it was, I got kind of, you know, this is, the, this is kind of the amazing thing to me. I've never said this in an interview before, but I think... I, I uh, there was something. There, there was some. I, I kind of was amazed at the fact that, like the, like my first big session in 1968 was well before this. That was when my mentor and, like my, uncle, second father, Hal Blaine, got me this gig, this session. He turned me on to my first really big Hollywood session. Mm-hmm. Jim Webb, you know, uh, uh, the composer and the uh, conductor and arranger and the whole thing, big deal. All of Hollywood's finest musicians. And I didn't know about Cartage, so I, I'm late to the session right. and I'm carrying my own drums up the elevator at right. TT&G. Right. And the string players are all looking at this, this long-haired, weird guy that, you know, how, what in the world is he coming in late to this big <laughs> session? Right. I could just feel it. I, I felt the vibe horribly. Yeah. And I should have folded. A lot of people would have just folded. It right. was a, it was a yeah. moment that yeah. right. when I look back, I, 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 I amazed myself that I actually, not only did I get through that moment, right. you know, set up my drums while everybody's watching. Right. And, um, and then they put the chart in front of me and, you know, in those days, it was like uh, just seven pages sometimes. Yeah. And this was one of those, and I was young, so I could see like a hawk, you yeah. know, not like now. And so I, I had it out in front of me, and I looked at it, and I and I just remember saying, "Yeah, I could do this. This is this is." <laughs> and so we sat and we played, and I, I knocked it out of the park, you yeah. know. And 
And then they wanted to do a, a 30, it was a, for a radio station call. Yeah. Anyway, from that moment, basically, from that time, um, I, I, I think I, I realized that like the red light and all that stuff that's supposed to bother you and intimidate yeah. you, none of that stuff uh, got to me. And so, so for that reason, I think later on then, like what, a few years later, when I'm sitting in the room with John, and Spectre's in the control room, and uh, and I'm sitting there with Nikki and uh, Klaus. Klaus is sitting right in front of me. It's you know back in those days, uh, the uh, bleed was a good thing, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know just the blend of, of of the instruments in the room. Sure. Uh, you know then years later we we got to where everybody had to be baffled off and right. all that. You know which is something that John Lennon hated and yeah. Bob Dylan both. Yeah. They both had that in common. But but which song did you work so, on? So the song that we played, the first song, okay. So this tells me, I think I just answered my question, which I know sounds stupid, but I should have known this all along. But the night that the night of the day that I worked with Yoko, that night I I had to have heard Jim Gordon, the great Jim Gordon, who was one of my idols at the time. He he was a, a fantastic drummer. Uh, played on all kinds of big hit records and stuff. And uh, he was out in the studio playing on a song called Don't Want to Be a Soldier Mom. Right. And I was sitting in the room, <clears throat> so I had the advantage of seeing what was not working and what wasn't, you know. Um, and plus, I'm sitting there with, with John and, and Phil talking amongst themselves, like, well, you know, why, why shouldn't it be like this? Or why, don't, why can't he do it like that? And um, then at one point, Phil turned to me and said, can you do that? Do you, you, you know, because I kept sort of nodding, I guess. I knew what they were right. going for. And he said, can you do that? And I said, yeah, but I'm not going to go out there now and do it. And I'm not going to do that, you know, in front of my idol. I'm not going to. Right. Go and, and just say, move over, you know, that I, I yeah. would have rather cut my arm. So, so, uh, they then, so the, then the plan must have been, this is the part that I don't quite understand about the Eric thing. When he said, do you want to come and play with John? Uh, I still don't have that chronologically correct, but in, in any case, the thing is, that when I arrived there that day to, to yeah. play with John, uh, we didn't do, uh, I don't want to be a soldier, man. we did Jealous Guy. That right. was the first song. And so I didn't know that that's the way things worked in the studio. You know, I thought, wow, what are we doing? I thought I, we were going to play that song that I, and so we did Jealous Guy, and it, I was completely immediately mesmerized. It was one of those things. Uh, I mean, so it's one of those songs. So, so they don't have. I mean, this is obviously an incredible song. Yeah. And and they don't. When you walk in, is John? They've already laid the track down, or you're going to hear it the oh, first no. time when those, you play. Those are, those days. You don't lay a track down. You you go in and you record with the musicians. So live. so so he he walks in, and I mean, I'm sure this happened to you many times, but it's like boom, genius song for the ages. I mean, do you do you know it the all moment I you know, hear it? I mean, no, are you... All, well, all I know is that was the beginning, and I've said this many, many times in interviews after that, that was the beginning for me for realizing the difference in songwriting and mm -hmm. songwriters. Mm -hmm. Because after that, that was my whole career. That's been my whole life, right. is playing on people's songs. Right. And so songwriting... When 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 I played that song that day and listened to the we we played multiple takes I don't recall I don't recall it like that but it on the track sheets it's it's definitely that we played multiple takes um, and I think it probably was because it was so easy to do and so so mesmerizing and plus you know you're in the presence of of John and Phil. Um, but John, did they give you, you know, notes? Did he give you notes? Like, did, no, no, there, there, there were no notes. You know, I could have, you know, nowadays it's like a thing. I've become lazy, like, like most musicians. You know, we write our charts out when we hear. No, somebody. I don't mean notes that way, but like, 
the interaction, sort of the collaboration. So oh, said like, it, like what yeah, to do? No. Like, it was just, no, you were no, just that's, in the that's space. The thing. That's another thing that John Incredible. Lennon and Bob Dylan have always shared that, that blew my mind as the years went by. Neither one of them ever told me what to do. Mm. Incred- well, that's a testimony to it, you as well. Well, it, that, you would think that that's testimony to me, uh, but um, I'm, I'm told what to do a lot. You know, mm-hmm. in the studio with with a lot of different people, producers and stuff. It's not not told what to do, but right. su- you know, suggestions, strong suggestions. And when and I'm the type of person, if I get a strong suggestion, that's where I'm going. Yeah, that's just the way I came up. You know, I mean, uh, what what was it about John? I mean, could you when you because you worked on a lot of these solo projects of his? You know, were did when you saw him? Were you just what what were those elements that made him? so special, like as an individual, as a person, you know? Well, well, first of all, you know, that, that, the, the songwriting thing was the first thing that I noticed about him, uh, that his song played itself. Mm-hmm. It, it literally played itself. There was no, and, and there, there are always, with every John Lennon song, there was always some tricky uh, measures, mm-hmm. like a 5-4 like a bar, and, and I would say this stuff to him, and he didn't, you know, he's, he didn't know what a 5-4 bar was. <laughs> right. I didn't care. You know, he was accommodating yeah. right. the lyric. Yeah. Right. Which is obviously what you're supposed to do. But my point being that even though uh, his songs had odd bars in them at times, they just, it, they were so structured so beautifully that they actually played themselves. You um, know, when you did... And, the- Go ahead. And that was that was a part of, of who, what I found out he was about, you know. He was like... Because people used to banter, you know, they'd, they'd throw the word around genius and stuff. And, uh, and I remember, you know, from, from my jazz days and the, and the people in the jazz world, you know, you, you don't throw that word around, you know. Right. And so I never thought of him like that. But I thought of him as, as brilliant. Like, like, I wish everybody was that brilliant. Sure. Because then, you know, you, could, you couldn't do anything wrong. <laughs> you know, and, and, I mean, and for me, and when you worked with him, you probably really couldn't do anything. Yeah, because he that wasn't was trying thing. to. He wasn't trying to be in your area. He was focused on his challenges. Yeah, yeah, and, exactly. I mean, he he was real hard on the guitar players because mm-hmm. he was a guitar player, mm-hmm. and he always said that he was the greatest get, uh, rhythm guitar player in the world. Mm-hmm. And I'm not gonna. I wouldn't ever have uh, doubted that. Yeah, honestly. Um, and, 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 and I'll say that I always thought that about Bob, too. Mm-hmm. Bob Dylan had the most incredible guitar feel. Mm-hmm. And so that's another thing they shared. But, but with John, um, he, you, could, you could see as I got to know him as a person, mm-hmm. he, was, he was just his brilliance as a, as a musician and as, a, as, a, uh, as just a cat, you know, just a guy... With a brilliant mind, he was he was uh, more curious than anything else, and so that's what he oh, that's what I loved about him, and that's what he loved about me, because he would ask me all these things, and and we'd we'd talk, and I'd tell him about you know my version of this or my version of that, and George was like that too. They really wanted to know, you know what what made uh, people. Tick, Americans tick. You know, you know what, what's it, the? It, it, is that a in because you worked with all the Beatles, right? Do you, do you feel like that's a mag, There's a magic from these guys together. Like, was there a magical force together? Oh, like nobody's ever seen. Yeah, I mean, I mean those no, those records like that they made together are sort of, you know, they're like a pyramid or a, they, you know they, should they be hanging are, in the are, Louvre, and, you know. And and the thing too is, you see, is uh the the thing about it is is if you analyze it like I did, you know, as a being there close with them, analyzing it from that uh, perspective as well as from you know just being a, a fan of the music, you know you couldn't help but be a fan of the music. It was everywhere. It was mm-hmm. all the time everywhere. And it was good. It wasn't something that would annoy you, right. You know, there was nothing annoying about anything in their their music. so, so to analyze it for me was amazing in that you had Ringo who really couldn't play a proper role. He still can't today. Right. 
you know, he's one of my, I count him as one of my dearest, closest friends, and he feels that way about me, and, and right. it just, it, 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 uh, it, it tears me up. It wells me up when I think about right. Ringo. Right. And because he's so, you know, the stuff he's gone through. And, uh, and so, anyway, when I first met him, I, you know, that's all I could do is just keep pumping him up and telling him, man, you changed the freaking face of rock and roll drumming, you know, and he, he just wouldn't have it. He thought I was, like, just full of crap, you know, like right. just trying to pump him up. And, and he, he wouldn't have it. He wouldn't believe it. But that's what a job they did on him in England. Right. They, but he they, was an amazing drummer. Well, he they, a, yeah, I but, mean, but and, he and, didn't know that, and right. he didn't feel it. He right. didn't. They, the guys always, John and George both, John especially always told me that Ringo was his favorite. And he would say it loud in front of everybody, so that almost as if to make sure that everybody understood that just because I'm here, Ringo Starr will always be his favorite drummer. You know? Do you remember meeting my dad? What's that? Do you remember meeting my dad? I do remember meeting your dad, yeah. I, uh, I was in England again, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and Leon called. I had been working with Leon off and on, doing a lot of stuff with Leon. Leon and, Russell. And, uh, yeah, yeah, Leon, Leon Russell. Russell. Yeah. Another, one of the greats of all. And those were amazing all. tours. Wow. Now, now, well, I never did any touring with Leon. Not any at all? No, I, I never there did. There weren't no. uh, two was, drummers? There that's another two, story I'll try to make. There weren't really, two drummers on a tour? no. No? No, there was supposed to be. It was yeah. supposed to be me and Chuck Blackwell. Right, right. But I quit the band <laughs> 30 minutes, literally, before I was supposed to be <laughs> at Sky Hill, which was uh, Leon's house in the valley. Yeah. And uh, then we were supposed to take the van to the airport. Yeah. I panicked, and I just said, I can't do this. Right. I can't go out and... Because we had just done Mad Dogs, I think. And, yeah. And, and Mad Dogs' tour was... It was one of the great times of my life it, in so many ways it was it was magnificent the band there was no band like that uh, right. it was just amazing and joe cocker was mm -hmm. incredible the the people that would come to the show the the culture at the time everything mm -hmm. about the mad dogs and englishmen this big circus on the road right. was amazing it was uh, a one of a kind thing in a person's life but it also was expensive to me f in my life like right. it just when I was done with that tour, I, I felt like I was done with that. I, I can't do that anymore. Is it that performing anymore. live just takes something out of you? What, what do you no, think? No, no, no. Nothing about the music or, uh, or, uh, or, or playing live. No, that that was the that was the essence of of the great part of it. The, the, the thing, the thing that was was uh, hard was, you know, the, the way you live when you're mm -hmm. doing that. You know, you. Everybody loves you over the moon, right? Yeah. You know, the audience, you can't do anything wrong. You're, you're getting all this love every night from sure. the audience, and you're feeling big and, and lovely, right? Loved. Yeah. And, uh, and so then your whole life, like, uh, becomes uh, this thing about me, you know? And, yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, so it, it's just too much, you know. It, it was too much. I, I had to get home and, and be with my kids and my wife and uh, and and try to be normal and play on records. That's what I wanted to do. So so you met so my dad. Leon. I right. called Leon. Yeah, you know, and I told him I can't do it. You know, I forgot. I obviously don't remember what my words were, but it was it was painful. Yeah, and but to his credit, Leon Russell. Bless his heart, you know, good oaky man that he was. <laughs> he said to me, "Well, okay, Jimmy Lee," <laughs> and that was it. And yeah. I, Aww. and I just, I loved him for that. And I, and I got to play with him many times after that, you know, yeah. on different projects, records, his records. I played on really, really, uh, his his really big hit, the the one really big hit he had. He was um, a beautiful musician. Yeah, he <sighs> was. There was nobody like uh, Leon. Yeah. There was nobody like Leon Russell. Uh, uh, period. But his piano playing was to play with Leon. I always said that whatever drummer or bass player had the privilege of being able to play with Leon would have, it would have raised their game to the point where, you know, they would have realized they're good players because that's what it takes yeah. for a musician is to be with a play with with greatness, 
And then that, then you realize where you fit in this or if you don't fit or right. whatever. Right. But Leon was one of those kind of guys. Leon, for me, it was Leon and, and Mac, Dr. John, right. Mac Rebinac. And both of those guys, fortunately, were in my life big time. Um, do you remember okay. meeting my dad? Yeah, let's go yeah. back to where, your dad. Where was, because you met him in England. So where did you meet him? Uh, oh, your dad? Yeah. Right. So we were, so we were um, uh, in England, uh, uh, there on, uh, on, in, in Chelsea. And uh, I forget who called. But it was, no, it was Leon, what am I saying? Uh, Leon called and said, hey, we're going to do uh, uh, some songs with Bob, uh, with Dylan, and uh, we'll meet up in New York, okay? It'll be uh, Jesse, Jesse Ed Davis, guitar great, uh, another Oki from, mm -hmm. from Oklahoma City, and Carl Radel, my Tulsa buddy on bass, and uh, me and Leon. And so I said, oh, man, okay, <laughs> bad Fantastic. And everybody was like, Bob was, Bob was everybody's fantasy. Like, that's all he was because people, they were, people are always trying to, just, you know, it, it's, it never really has changed really with Bob. Yeah. You, you always just wanted to, f to figure him out. Yeah. You wanted to figure, well, okay, so this tells us that. Right. <laughs> that, oh, well then, and so just, you know, and then, with Bob, Bob always said that his music will tell you anything you want to know, right? Right. And so the 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 people like Leon and and George and John and all of them, you know, they 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 got with his music to the point where it changed their lives, obviously. Right. And uh, and so they just wanted to be around him. They just wanted to be around Bob Dylan in any kind of way. And uh, so we when when uh we showed up uh in new york i think it was the um i never knew for certain but i think it was something called the blue door studio something like that mm -hmm. and uh it was uh, kind of a, a wet day and it was kind of chilly and i remember bob i think bob had a bob obviously had some kind of little cold going because there were kleenex <laughs> <laughs> laying around and, and all the ashtrays everybody smoked so the ashtrays were everywhere right. and there were Kleenex in every ashtray so they were all on fire and, right, and so and I remember telling Jesse I said uh, man you know uh, at, the, at that time there was a guy I forget his name but he was going through Bob's trash Ugh, yeah, he was like he, he became yeah. famous for Ugh. going yeah, through the terrible. trash you were you were just yeah, a, well, you were a little trash. baby right yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was he, awful. He was looking at your diapers yeah. and stuff. Oh, I know. It was anyway, terrible. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. the thing was that this guy wanted to, you know, he wanted something sure. for uh, uh, Bob's, obviously, or he wanted, he, he was loving the attention and everything. Yeah, we so, used to have to drive out to the dump to throw our trash away. Yeah, you awful. had to finally do that. That's funny, man. Yeah. So, uh, so in our minds, you know, in our pictures, we, we're, we're seeing Bob's trash going through, all the, this guy going through his trash all the time. And so I, and he would like, they at one point he was like supposedly going to buy stuff, mm -hmm. and so I told Jesse, I said, "Let's get those Kleenexes, man, <laughs> and we'll we'll put them in a sack <laughs> yeah. and we'll sell them to this guy." Yeah. And uh, it was like a, seri a sort of a half serious moment there yeah. for a minute. But um, in this session, he, he did, you do knocking on heaven's door, yeah. What's that? You do knocking on heaven's door in this session, yeah. That's one of the songs you played there. Knocking on heaven's door. No, 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 no. No, That's this later. session was um, the song was uh, "Watching the River Flow," right? Which is one of my all-time favorite. Yeah, uh, it's a beautiful song. Yeah, it's just that no, that little song no, just came together. And and the thing that I remember was Bob was uh, Leon was very cool. Leon was always very cool, and and I knew he was freaking out because he was in the room with Bob Dylan, and he was writing basically with him, you know, or about to or or, right. or being a part of the I you know part of the writing in some kind of way but Bob had this stuff Bob had the song already done mm -hmm. except for the lyrics and so we're playing it we're we're kind of jamming on it a little bit and and Bob is standing against the wall like the wall is here and he's standing like this and he's writing and I can see his lips moving 
And so I'm, I'm fascinated. I'm going, wow, he's writing this, the lyrics. And he's trying to hear his voice because we're playing. And so he wants to hear his voice. And so that's the way he's doing it, by bouncing back. So I was fascinated by that. Yeah. And then all I can tell you is that uh, we, had a, we had like a, <clears throat> like a first playback. And I was shocked at how good it was. Right. Uh, it just was like, it was, it was like the next moment that was like that might have been a jealous guy with John. You know, uh, um, because uh, that came after that. It was, it was, it was Bob first with with Leon, and and, and when we played that song, and, and it played itself. Right. It just absolutely played itself. The words were killing me. The words were just, you know, you, you just knew you were doing something that was interesting and amazing. It wasn't like. Words that you'd heard over and over, and and you know a nice kind of love song or whatever. It was, it was some, it was some amazing. St- it was Bob Dylan, his mind at work, singing a song called "Watching the River Flow." I'll just sit here and watch the river flow, and it was just killing. It was just, and w- so the first playback, we were in the control room, and being in the control room uh, after a playback can really be, uh, what's the word? Um, it, it can be uh, not daunting, it, it's, but it's like it can be difficult right. to, to, because you don't, it, it depends on your personality. I've never been the type of personality to go, man, that's friggin' great. But did right. you hear that? How right. great that! Listen, how great that is! I right. can't do that. There are other people, musicians that I work with that can do that, and right. I love that when that happens because then everybody focuses on that, and we're also in agreement and everything, you know. But nobody in that little crowd is going to do that, and it was because of Bob. Right. I learned years later when you're in a room with Bob Dylan, nobody talks. Right. George was the only one that was able to to speak around Bob and be really. Like, you know, because well, George, George, George was George, you know. Yeah, and my he, dad and loved George. He also yeah. knew that, that uh, Bob uh, really loved him a lot, too. Yeah. They, there was a, a tremendous, uh, um, you know, uh, George <laughs> idolized Bob, obviously. You know, but, you know, this, this so you, nobody's saying anything, but what, what was the element between, because these are the two, John and my dad are the two real, um, you know, the, you're you're one of the only people who actually really knew both of them. What, what's the what's the sort of common element between these two well, guys? That's, yeah, that's that's funny when 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 you say that because I I thought about that after you told me that the other day, and I was trying to think. And you may be right. I don't know who else it is that had both not worked with them know, creatively uh, like that. Right, and um, and and I did. I had I spent really, really good quality time with John uh, and Yoko. But, but John, John uh, 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 without Yoko a lot too, because of the, he, when he left or when she sent him away, he spent a lot of time in L.A. So uh, I had a lot of good time with John. And with Bob, I had an amazing amount of good quality time with Bob through being joining him for two years, a little over two years, uh, which which I never did with anybody else. Uh, I never, I never wanted to be in anybody's band, you know, sure. for like that. But but with him, I was there for over two years, and then we we had all this great quality time with uh, the Wilburys. Sure, you know when you're you he was trapped basically in those <laughs> videos, <laughs> and so we all had you know we had trapped and. Uh, and uh, Tom, Tom and uh, George had a great time with, with Bob. Jeff was always a little, he, he just, Jeff would kind of clam up a little bit. Bob, I know Bob appreciated Jeff's genius, you know, his brilliance. Sure. Uh, but Bob is not the type, you know, to go, hey, man, that was, <laughs> you yeah. just don't hear Bob do, you doing know, it like, very much. I shouldn't say that because, it, I, because it's not totally true. Right. The things about Bob that, you know, John was like his, 
everything was, you know, I don't say it's just heart, but like everything was on his sleeve. You mm -hmm. know, John was what you see as you get. That's, you know, he was one of those kind of personalities. And he, and he loved having everything filmed, everything recorded, you know, everything about his life and all that. Bob was just the opposite. Bob was more like relatable to me. Uh, I, I mean, I was more, I could relate to what Bob was trying to do because Bob, and, and I didn't really know this, even knowing mm -hmm. Bob as, as well as I did, I didn't know this until his book. Right. And his book is, makes it very clear that he, all he wanted was to just, you know, have a record deal and, uh, yeah, and uh, and you know, and to make money and and have a have his family be yeah. protected and live in a nice place. That's all he ever wanted. Yeah, you know, he. I, I think one of the things that's often uh, not discussed with him is just to, how kind he is. You know, how gentle human being he is. Because you know, not talking doesn't mean that you're you're uh, judging other people. You know, it just means that you're, you know, not talking. Yeah. Very true. You know. Um, uh, when John or my dad, when these songs would just fall out at these sessions, like you know, double fantasy sessions, these are some of the greatest songs ever written. Like, what would you, what would you do? Like, what would you be thinking when those things would? Because one thing well, you're having lunch, you're talking, you're chatting, you're making jokes about what you're gonna do, and then boom, these songs drop out. You know? Yeah. Well, now you know, double fantasy was was uh, the New York guys. Didn't you play on that? No, I didn't. Know no, that, that was Andy thinking. Newmark. Right. My right. my good buddy Andy Newmark. Andy uh, was so but, over the but, moon. But even not that. Just you're with him, and these songs are falling out. Like you're hearing these incredible songs for the first time. Nobody's ever heard right. these songs. You know what's that right. like when you're the only person who's heard "Jealous Guy"? Well, you you know that's that's the thing. You know uh, that that's what I'm talking about. It's uh, it's uh, it, it, it's it hasn't. You know, I I have been very very grateful. For, for the fact that I was I was able to be, you know, the first person to hear some of John Lennon's songs and some of Bob Dylan's songs. Yeah. And, um, you know, amongst a little group of people to be the first people to hear those songs, that's a, that's a great blessing. That's a fantastic thing for a, a musician, you know, to, you to know, be in that position. And, and that, I, I'm, I've been really grateful about that. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. It, it, it truly has been a... Uh, well, Jim, thank you for coming in, you know, and, and sharing all this stuff with us. Yeah. That was great. Well, Appreciate uh, it. I, you know, I, uh, I, I hope that you can use. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was I, great. There were so many things I wanted to say well, about. I wanted to say about. Uh, I had. I said. I, I. What I wanted to do is I wanted to draw a parallel, you know, uh, with, with the uh, with the two of them, yeah, uh, John and Bob, and they they were so much the same kind of, without being at all the same person. Right. Right? Totally, what do you call it, gregarious, uh, uh, whatever, uh, totally private yeah. uh, guy. Like, and, uh, and then somebody like me coming, being in each of their lives, you know, I always found like I was kind of a little bit of both of them, you know. Right. But to be fascinated by, by the fact that, that uh, these two guys were so much alike musically, right. and and yet not actual musically, but right. the same way they treated and thought about music and and felt about music. And then one night, uh, one day, one morning with John, um, uh, I don't. Shall I? Shall I yeah, just keep yeah. going? Okay. Yeah. So one morning with John, I um, uh, I would I was staying with them at the Dakota when we were doing a couple of different records back there at record plant. They, they just, they liked me and they wanted me to be around, you know? So, uh, I, I stayed with them there. I had my own room and, uh, it's the room that looks, it's the second floor up right. when you're on the corner there yeah. and you're looking at the park. The park that was yeah. my room. Yeah. So yeah. when nice. we're back there, we always, always <laughs> yeah. look up and imagine standing there looking out. But, um, one morning, uh, we were, you know, having breakfast together in the little kitchen that overlooked the Rosemary's Baby thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. Anyway, so so we're sitting there, and and uh, I had my glasses on. Not these. I, I had uh, I wore a little little funny hippie looking uh, blue glasses. Th they were kind of like John Lennon yeah. type glasses <laughs> in a way. The they weren't glasses. round, but they were like that. And so he was fascinated. He says. He says, uh, "What?" Um, 
he was fascinated by the fact that I didn't need to wear them. They weren't prescription. He said, those aren't prescription? And I said, no. I, he said, well, why are you wearing them? And I said, because I, I feel like the need to hide my eyes sometimes, you know, like if I smoke too much and my eyes get red and yeah. I don't want anybody to know I'm high. <laughs> and uh, and, and he, he laughed and he thought that was really funny. And then so we started talking about glasses. So I said, he, he said, he, he put my glasses on and he went, oh, jeez. And so I said, well, let me try yours. So I put his glasses on and they were like, that's thick. Right, right. And they just, they went down to a little point where, and I couldn't, I yeah. couldn't see a thing. I said, man, you're almost blind. Yeah. <laughs> that very same scenario I did with Bob. Right. So many years later, I don't know sure. how many years later, sure. but so we were, we obviously weren't in some kitchen, but we were somewhere on the road. Right. And for some reason, he let me try on his glasses. Yeah. And they were different kind of glasses. They were bigger. Bob's glasses yeah. were bigger, but they were the same friggin' thing. Uh, yeah. So what yeah. is that? Like, what, he, so what does that mean? They both are listening to things of the universe that no, the rest of they us. They both are not oh. looking well, you know, at things yeah, the way you and I look at stuff. In that's a way exactly that right. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's, no, but don't you think? Yeah. That, I mean, that's yeah. a physical thing there. That, that you know, there's something that's inside. Yeah. I I have one question before you leave. Sure. Because. For you, that moment you said when you you walked into that session and you were you were able to maintain your inner place, and you said, "You know what? I can do this." When you're in, when you're in with all these extraordinary places that you've been, how do you hold on to? Because you have those incredible instincts. Like, what's that process of? I'm here and I'm listening and I'm collaborating and I'm communicating. And what's yours and what's part of the group? Like I, I mean, to me, a drummer is like such a, that is the person that is keeping us connected like yes, emotionally. That's right. right. You're and the catcher. Yeah. On the team. So how do you be with in all the work? Like where do you? Are you listening? Do you go to another place? Like you probably can't share that part of your process, but it's just so amazing that you can do that. You can hold on and do all these complex. Rhythmic mathematical things that you do. Yeah, that's, that's my question. <laughs> okay, well that that's beautifully uh, asked, uh, and and I will say this: um, I don't normally uh, say I don't I don't easily go to the place where where what the place that you're talking about. Uh, and and I shouldn't be that way. I'm I'm feeling more. The older I get, the more I feel like there's no reason why I have to hold back and say what I believe has been the greatest thing in my life. But I believe that, and I will say this at this time, and you can use this or you or not, however you want to do it. But my mama uh, was a little Mexican lady. She now we know that she wasn't just Mexican. She was. Uh, she was uh, Mexican, Spanish, uh, uh, Basque, whatever mm. that is, mm -hmm. and uh, Sub-Saharan African. Mm. My mom told me when I was a little baby, she said, because she knew I was afraid of the dark, and, and, but yet she had me go, and in Tulsa in those days, they had no, no street lights. So she would say, go, to the, go up to the store. I, I need some Clorox or something. And... Uh, and I would always complain, I, I, it's dark, I don't want to go, I don't want to go. And she, so she told me, she said, just say this little prayer, honey, and you'll be okay. And so she taught me this, this little prayer, en el nombre de Dios. And I would say it, and I'd get there and I'd get back and everything would be fine. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, this is what I got to do. And... Uh, so, so prayer became like a big deal with me. Yeah. And yet I didn't, I, I had problems with, with religion. Right. You right. know, as, right. as a thing. And so uh, I had this little conflict. This is a conflict that, that everybody has. I don't care who you are. There's some point in time when you're going to have a conflict about religion. You know, even if you say you don't believe in religion, you don't believe in God, if, you, if you're the strongest atheist in the world, there's still going to be some little conflict there. It's just the way we're, we, we're made. So um, I, I figured the many times 
that I, uh, I can't tell you the very, very first time, but I remember the one time that I told you about, the, you know, when, when Hal sent me on this uh, session as, as a sub, just to, like, throw me in the deep end. Yeah, right. All right, let's see what you got. Yeah. And I went and I did that. I pulled that off. I was praying like crazy. Yeah. I prayed before. <laughs> I prayed during. I prayed after. <laughs> and then, then I really knew, okay, this is it. You know, this is it. I mean, it's just if, as long as I pray, and, I, and then my prayer got to where I would, I would, it wouldn't be because in the early days of praying, it would just be praying the words, just saying the words. Then pretty soon the praying got like where I believed, like I knew I had to believe it. And if I really believed it, that's it, you know? And so that, so that was fine. Everything was going on fine. I'm having a career playing and, Bob calls, and this is right during a time when it's very bad for me with drugs. I hate to, you know, I hate to admit that, but it, it was bad. I was being careless and really, really stupid, but really careless. And it could have been, and because it did many, many people, that was the slide they need to just go yeah. all the way down. Yeah, yeah. Uh, many people. Yeah, and. Uh, and and so instead of that, I get a call from Bob Dylan. <laughs> yeah, knocking on heaven's door. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, well, yeah, knocking on heaven's door was the second song that I did with him. You know, yeah, that was, the that metaphor, was another though. story. But I, I've said that so many times. But the thing is that, uh, yeah, yeah, knocking on heaven's yeah. door. Anyway, so after that, uh, when I got with Bob, I was I, I basically was saved from myself. I was saved from from this thing that I was doing. I was no longer at home. You know, going to sessions and then going to the canyon, going down to Malibu, going here, going there to all my rich friends and and doing their drugs and stuff. You know, which is which is a sad thing to think. Th those people are mostly gone now. All those friends of mine, and they were friends. They weren't. They were really good friends. Yeah. And and I I treasure my time with them, even though it was crazy like that. But I survived it, and and most of them didn't. In fact. I don't think any of them have. Just some of the guys that are still around that uh, that we, you know. But anyway, that that uh, that is the reason why I was. I think it, it's the fact, and I always bring it to my mom. You know, she just she was the one that told me when you're afraid, just say a little prayer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank you for sharing. Yeah, that. yeah. Thank you, Jim. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Okay, so let's turn the cameras yeah. off. That was great, Jim. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right. I want to yeah. play a you couple of Papa's songs. Oh yeah, yeah. Let me hear that. Thanks for watching or listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Click here for the next episode and respond. We we really want to hear from you.